uh, for what God might do and for what we're going to do uh, in hopes to please and serve him. And I want to just read a passage here. It talks about shortly after uh, Christ had been tempted by Satan and he entered into his ministry. And it says, And great crowds followed him from Galilee to the Decapolis and from Jerusalem to Judea and from beyond the Jordan. In this moment, I just, I just want you to think about this. He says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. Imagine that moment. Do you think the disciples paid attention? Christ shared his words with them? I think they were on the edge of their seats and that their hearts were filled by these words, by the words that Christ said and have been recorded since then? Today, as we enter into this time, I just wanted you to imagine that moment. Crowds of people everywhere. Jesus tells this guy, he's saying, you know what, let's just, let's just sit here for a minute in the midst of all the craziness. And just, and just let me teach you for a while. I just want to teach you right now and that those words of Christ that we're going to prepare to consider today, that they would be as important to us as they were to those disciples that day on the mountaintop. Heavenly Father, God, we give you so much thanks, Lord, for your word that you sent your son, God, to, to share these words with us that we might know and serve you better. And that, God, I pray they will just hold the importance in our heart that they should, that our love of your word will be appropriate and pleasing to you. I pray for our time of worship today, Lord, that our songs will please you and that the message you brought today will, will be yours. From the land on the ears and the hearts of those who need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing. Jesus, there's nothing
fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress. You go before us. He's a fortress. Nothing can stand against the He is a fortress. Thank you, Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? Nothing but the blood. 
song we could ever sing. Worthy of every praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me jesus the name above every other name jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. righteous but you the blood of Jesus Christ we were talking with youth today like how do we know it's not a, I was bad and then I was suddenly good but we're sinners and we need you daily correcting and convicting and guiding Jesus Christ is there to confess our sins, to recognize our sins, to repent from our sins, to turn and walk the other way. It is not righteousness within us. God, I pray.
pray that relationship that each of us has with you. God, if, if there is one in here, one listening that, that does not have a relationship with you, God, that that would change today, that that call on their heart would be a burden they cannot sit under in another moment and they would come forward and accept the love and the gift of Jesus Christ. But for those of us in a relationship with you, God, relationship would grow so deep. It would be such an intimate relationship, God. We hurt for what hurts you. When we sin, we we know that conviction is so strong. We can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit within us. God, and that we would have the courage and the confidence to walk in the power of the resurrection. Pray for the words that you've laid on Scott's heart, that they would move and stir us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Grab my Bible. Before we start too deeply into the passage today, I feel like I'm obligated to uh, at least talk about the chili cook-off last week. Only under duty will I do this because I did not, we did not win, even though I put my aunt, my brother-in-law, and my dear friend as judges, I forgot to tell them which chili was mine, ours, and we did not win that. Who did win that? Who was it? Oh, was that Miss Brenda? All right, good job, Brenda. We had, we had eight, eight chilies. We had a lot of chilies this year, and we had a great turnout. I'm, I'm normally pretty good at counting how many people we have. I didn't, I didn't that night, but I don't know. We had a good number. We had a great time. Uh, really enjoyed the fellowship, and uh, and Brenda's chili was was not bad. Okay. <laughs> Oh, Nikki. See, Nikki doesn't want me to recognize her because she finished twice for the second year in a row. Second, second for the second year in a row. Kind of that always bridesmaid thing right there. But uh, just tweak it, tweak it a little bit. It'll be all right. It'll come around. But uh, uh, so we, we really enjoyed that. And it was just, I don't know, the, the fellowship and the relationships that we see you building with each other is really one of the most rewarding parts of what we do here at Roundtop that, you know, it's not just that you like us or we like you, but we see different people gathering and talking and, and trading phone numbers and making plans to do things. Man, that just fills us up. So I think that's what God is, I think that's God's vision for us as a church and as a community of believers, is that we would do that. Probably going to sneeze at some point, so be prepared for that. So a few years ago, I always say a few years, but as they get older, that means somewhere between three and 40. Uh, a few years ago, we were studying in a Sunday school class. Julia may or may not remember this, but we kind of, as a lot of Sunday school sessions do, oh God, this is really good. We, if you think it's distracting for you, it's just that tickle, you know, like I know it's coming. <laughs> It's there. It's just like it's just right there. Uh, yeah, if you need something, if you need to do something real quick before we get started, this would be the moment. Ah, uh, you know, this has never happened, right? I've never. If you realize I've never sneezed in the pulpit before, and and you know, almost three years. But we were in study school class, and we may have stumbled upon the topic of how difficult it is to raise children, right? That's common ground. Amen. I mean, just talk about that with a group of parents, and everybody's engaged. Like, everybody wants in on that conversation. And a, a good friend of ours, he said, I just wish, he said, I just wish there was a book that would tell you how to raise kids. So I'm the teacher, and I'm looking at my Bible, looking at him, and I'm looking at my Bible, and I'm like, do I just say there is a book? Like, we studied every Sunday. 
or do I not embarrass him by saying that? And we directed us back to the conversation that, uh, you know, maybe the Bible is a good place to start as we consider how to raise uh, our children. But so the, the message today is entitled, How to Build a Healthy Family. And, you know, as a pastor, whether you know it or not, oftentimes you get to watch me wrestle with the things that God has laid on my heart from the pulpit, which is a, a unique opportunity and burden uh, for me. Because we often look at our family, we're like, man, it just, like, we just don't seem to be healthy, like spiritually healthy, and how do we get there from here? And so why is that so difficult? It's so difficult to have a healthy family, and, and where are we failing and missing things? And this all kind of came to fruition because, as I told you last week, I'm really, I'm really wanting to lean into the New Testament for a while. And I thought, man, what if we just did the next few weeks on the words of Christ? Like, we're just going to preach from the words of Jesus himself. We're going we're gonna to slip away from the prophecy or uh, the church directives that Paul gave us. And let's just talk about what Jesus said for a few weeks before we look at anything else. So as I was considering those things, uh, I just looked at the Bible. I'm like, man, when you look at the red-letter Bible, when you look at the entire Bible and you get to the red-letter section, there's really not a lot of red letters. Not really. Not when you consider the, the, the whole Bible of course, because I'm a numbers guy, I looked it up. I'm like, how many words in the Bible are actually the words of Christ? Because that was suddenly important to me. 31,000. In the Bible, approximately 31,000 words are attributed directly to Christ. And that seems like quite a few. Maybe not when you consider the whole Bible. Then you have to remember a lot of those things are repeated four times in the four Gospels. And a lot more are repeated in the first three Gospels. So what we come up with is really not a lot of words. Like if you want to be an expert on something in the Bible, being an expert on the words that Jesus spoke would be relatively easy as you're looking for a, a small piece of that large, that large book to maybe become knowledgeable on. And we are left with the, the realization that, man, Christ... His ministry covered such a short period, and the words that recorded were recorded were not that many. Look at the impact. I mean, if you, don't see, if you don't see God's hand in that, if you don't see the divine nature of what he said and the fact that we gather here today over 2,000 years later to still consider the words that Christ spoke, if that doesn't indicate the, the nature of who he was and the nature of what he was here to do, uh, then I, I don't think you're paying attention. But today we're going to consider some words of Christ and, you know, and didn't obviously come here just to count them uh, or put a numerical value on them. We're going to consider Jesus' teaching uh, directly from Jesus. And we're going to cover some passages today that uh, most of you have heard. Probably some of them you have in your pocket that you have dedicated to memory. But I want to look at them with a different lens tonight. I believe so often we read the Bible and we have two main approaches to the passages. One is, how does this affect me? How can I take this scripture? How can I take this passage? And how can I do something with it? And I think the next thing we think is, okay, now how do I take this passage into the world? What's the application for, for mission work or for our nation? Or how do we take this now somewhere else? But what I think we miss, how does that passage affect my family? I think we miss a, like a real obvious and simple step with, with our study of Scripture and how we might apply it. I think many times we're great at applying it to our own life, and we're great at considering how it applies elsewhere in the world. But do we really look at these passages and think, man, how can 
this work in our home? Is, is, is there a, a place for this particular passage in the relationships within our home? I don't think we consider that enough. I think we miss that obvious step. We know that our walk should look differently than non-Christians walk, a non-Christian's walk, but do we understand that the way our family functions should also look differently? Are we ready to accept that? Are we ready to look at life through a different lens and really go, man, does my family really look any different than a non-Christian family? Like a family that doesn't go to church, do they look just like my family? Or do we look different? And if so, why? And if not, why? Do we understand the powerful evangelical tool that a healthy family is? Amen? And when people see that healthy Christian family, do we understand the impact of that on people, on other families? Because we know people want to see us differently, so they might say, man, what's up with you? Because I'm not sure what you got going on, but it looks good, and you seem to have joy in times when it's hard to have joy. I mean, look at the Hill family, right? And they're buried in grief right now. What are they doing? Serving the Lord. Hey, Amen. Thank you. You don't think that looks different than the world? Tough day today. What'd you do? Serve God. That's what we're called to do. It's different. Man, it fills us up. You know, are we, 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 when we have this idea and we see some, some religions who will dress differently, right? They'll dress differently or, or, or they'll, they'll, they'll manage or cut their hair differently and we see that in them. And sometimes, well, can we be honest? And sometimes we want to throw stones at that because that's weird. Why you got to dress differently? What do you mean you can't cut your hair? Up with that, right? And we see that, and, and here it is, man. Here, here are people who are trying to be different in the world, and we as Christians who don't want to be quite that different tend to throw stones at that rather than say, man, good for you. It's great that you want people to see who you are. And we might not, agree, and we might not agree on that verse, amen? Like we might, not, we might not exactly agree on that particular passage, but man, I love where you are with your belief. And I love what you're doing. We're Christian brothers and sisters in that. We see people purposefully setting themselves aside. Are we willing to do that? Or are we willing to set ourselves aside from the world? Because i got to tell you, brothers and sisters, in case you've been asleep, the world is not friendly to different. Right? You're not, you're not going to do this, man. You're not going to put on the, 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 the Christian armor and get a lot of high fives from the non-Christian world. It's not a rewarding thing outside of the Christian community to be different and wear that Christian armor. We have to get past the idea that it's going to be an individual effort and think, man, how, do, how does a healthy family collectively set their heart on following God. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to build a healthy family. <laughs> and right now, some of us are thinking, man, if that one dude in our family would just get himself together, that would be a good start right there. <laughs> I know right where my family needs to start. It's with him or her. Immediately track to that person and think, man, that's all we need. Our minds will fall on the problems that everyone else in our family brings to the table. Which is why the words of Christ on the Sermon of the Mount are so important and why we're going to cover them today. And, and these words today that we're going to pack into our hearts and walk out of here with, and they're, they're for you, they're not just for you. As we may be, if you walk out of here with one thing that you think, you know what, Scott was right. If we do that, it's going to help our family. And then you just need to be attentive because I can, I will 
promise you as far as I can that soon you're going to come across someone who's going to need to hear that passage. and They're going to need to hear that scripture. Someone's going to come to you and go, I usually can't understand what's happening in my family. And you're going to have the opportunity to say, well, you know what? Let me just share something with you from what the Bible says that you might want to consider. While we are gathered here today in hopes of maybe improving the spiritual health of our families, brothers and sisters, we have to remember we're not here just to do that. We are here that we might take the word out of here to others who need it. You want a foothold? You want to get your toe in the door with a non-believer? Give them a tidbit that will help their home run better. Give them something that will make their family healthier and tell me they won't come back to you and say, thank you so much. And you can say, you know what, we talk about that stuff all the time at church. You come on with me. So, uh, it's interesting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful that today, God, we might consider a passage we've considered many times, but simply by looking at it a little differently and applying it to a different situation, Lord. It takes on new meaning and new importance to us that we might just, again, carry these words in our heart as we consider our families, those you've given to be closest to us that we would spend the most time with, that uh, would seek you in growing them. In Jesus' name. All right, if you want to leave, now's your chance. Because that's probably going to get a little uncomfortable. Uh, start with Matthew 7. We'll break these down as we go. And the first thing we're going to cover is uh, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. 1 through 5. And our first on the notes, it says, healthy families are honest with one another. And that can take on a lot of different things. It says, here we go, here we go. Judge not that you will not be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We tend to take this scripture and do one of two things with it. We might try to figure out how this applies to us, but more often than not, we want to figure out how it applies to others. Somewhere in between that is our family. How does this passage, because as Christians, when we hear judge not, a lot of times we're, we're, we're saddled with how we handle non-Christians. How do we judge or not judge Christians? And it just says, and in the end, brothers and sisters, when we get to the end of it, there is still some judgment to occur. It's not that we don't, not that we don't correct, not that through adjudication we don't establish right and wrong, but what is our posture when we're doing this? I've heard this passage many times before. Here, here, here's a note. When a husband and a wife refuse to judge one another harshly, the family is on its way to becoming healthier. Step one. Wait, you are thinking, wait a minute, what about my kids? <laughs> Brother Scott, I need you to talk to me about how to deal with my kids. Well, this is the log. This is what he's saying. He says the first thing we need to do is make sure the husband and the wife are modeling this in their relationship. Are they judging each other harshly? Because that's the log. See, sometimes we think the log is our own sin. We want to say, well, you know, I've got this sin problem, so I can't talk to Rick about his sin problem. No, brothers, the log is our attitude about, about how I talk. Why am I talking to Rick? Am I talking to him just to kind of build myself up? Or am I approaching him in Christian love? Say, man, I, I, just want, I just want to talk to you about this because I think maybe this isn't where you want to be in, 
this particular thing. I think maybe, I, mean, I, I think maybe you don't see what you're doing. And I just want to, I love you, and I think you should really look at this and consider this. The log is not our own sin, because I'm telling you, if the job is to eradicate our own sin, then we don't get to help anybody. Amen? Amen. So the point is, man, and, and, and how important is this within our family? If we're going to point out the failings of others, where is our heart in that moment? Is it loving? Or are we kind of just trying to build ourselves up by pointing out the faults of others? Are we trying to make ourselves more right by pointing out that someone else is wrong? So when we interpret this, when the greatest conviction should not be that we're going to work harder to judge others, that we're really going to understand that large piece of wood from our eye. Parents, don't care how old your kids are, we must be keenly aware of this, how we walk this out. What does this look like between us? Does our judgment, remember, we're not, I'm, we're not doing away with the judgment. Don't, don't, don't mishear that. But does our judgment feel more like criticism or Christian love? The judgment's, and judgment's a volatile thing. And if we're not right, if we haven't gotten the log out of our eye, when we deliver that judgment, it's going to be harsh. And it's going to do more harm than good. And we start practicing that as adults between ourselves. How do we approach each other? Because I'm telling you, my, my greatest convictions come from my wife. Because she loves me. And she tells me when I'm getting off track. And I don't always like it. Amen? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that one, you, understood, you, you felt me on that. And, and, and listen, it doesn't always go well. Because I get mad, right? I'm, some people say I'm immature sometimes. But, but when I come out of that immaturity, like, like when I'm able to look beyond myself and hear what she's saying and how she's saying it, I'm like, she's not really saying that to hurt me. She's saying that because she loves me. And, and then, oh, okay, so then there's a whole ball of conviction because now I've acted like a pouty baby in front of the kids. I've got to go back thank her for that, tell the kids that I was a pouty baby, right, and have a, little, have a little family devotion that they have to listen to while I talk about myself. Welcome to the pastor's house. Uh, so, so that's what Jesus is talking about. He's like, man, if you're doing this wrong, you're going to do so much damage. You're going to do so much damage. It has to be done right. And, and listen, brothers and sisters, it, a, the damage it can do in our homes, where we live, learn, and love together with our family is exponentially greater, and the good it can do is exponentially greater if we can just get this right. Because we have to teach our children. We're called to correct the sin of our children. But in this moment, as we prepare to do that, Christ would say, okay, man, where's your heart? Before you step into this parenting role of correcting your child's sin, where's your heart? What is it you want them to carry out of this home when they go? Do we want our children to parent the way we do? Do we? Do we hope they model us as parents when they leave the house? And sometimes I don't because I think I'm lousy at it. I hope sometimes they do so much better than I do. So uh, if anyone's not feeling bad yet, let's continue. 7-2, when it talks about the measure we will give, it says healthy families are more interested in giving than receiving. For with judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to, to you, to you. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So as we measure 
anything we may have or give, God says, are you using the same measure on yourself? Are you really just as happy to give as you are to receive? And nothing does more damage than this to this than commercialized Christmas. <laughs> Man, what a terrible thing that is. Because we are going to, we are going to enter a time of the year every year where we're going to shower children with gifts, and every time we give them something, we're going to say, better to give than receive. Say it with me. Here, open this. Here, open this. Here, open this. In a season built around giving, we pick that season to remind them it's better to give than to receive, when all they do is receive. This isn't just talking about things, right? How do we give our love? And what do we expect in return? How do we, how do we care or do for others in our family? What do we expect in return? How do we serve others in our family? What do we expect in return? Because if you're doing any of these things with an expectation, you can't serve someone with an expectation that's not serving anymore. You can't love someone with an expectation that's not love anymore. You're no longer giving. You're simply trying to repackage your desire to receive. Everything changes at that time. Listen. Never forget what God gave us and how little he expects in return. That's our measure for serving and giving and loving. We're expecting something in return. And God's saying, that's the measure that I'm going to use on you. Are you just expecting something or do you really love me? Do you really serve in my name? Or are you just waiting for a blessing? What's your heart in this? I will tell you, never miss the fact that as God refers to himself as our heavenly father, that is about as much about parenting as we need to understand from God, that he uses that parental relationship to describe his relationship with us, that relationship that is built on giving, not receiving. Matthew 7, 6, healthy families are protected by faithfulness. Love this verse a little bit. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Within the family, especially between the husband and the wife, and there are certain things that are blessed by God that are not blessed by God outside of marriage, amen? And he says, man, don't give that to other people. Your faithfulness to each other is what's important because the dogs and the pigs are not going to value it the way it should be valued. And like pearls, they will trample it into the mud. Our relationships with our spouses and with our children and with our brothers and our sisters and our family should be the most valuable relationships in our lives. And we have to hold them as valuable. We can't discard them for anything else. Because anything we discard them for is going to be dogs and pigs. That relationship is going to get trampled in the mud. We have to have a faithfulness to each other. And again, brothers and sisters, it starts with mom and dad. That special relationship that God has ordained as holy, we have to hold that as valuable as we expect our children to do these things. Are we willing to throw these relationships away? How would you ever do that? You're like, I would never do that. Well, listen to me. When you stop valuing it, that's the first step. And I'm not talking about like a physical action or actually doing something. I'm saying when you 
When you cease to value that special relationships, those special relationships in your family, you don't value your husband or your wife, kids. When you don't value your brothers or your sisters or your parents, then you have taken the first step of throwing that relationship to the dogs and the pigs because you're devaluing it. Matthew 7, 7 through 11 says, healthy families are enriched by prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer within those passages. It's, it's amazing how much Jesus puts in these, in these verses. Like it's just like the greatest hits. There's something, it's, it's sometimes a challenge for families. And if you're like your pastor and his family, Sometimes when the things are most difficult is when you forget to circle your family in prayer. As things get difficult within your family and the cracks show, we tend to go to neutral corners versus coming together and praying. We don't do that in the way we should. And not just individually, but together. Not just that I would pray for our family or that Julia and I would pray for our family, but that collectively the family would come together and pray for what God has given us as a family, that we would give thankfulness for that, and that we would verbalize the things that the Bible says we should do. Because I'm telling you, I, I love the prayer closet concept, but it can't just stay in the prayer closet. This is going to hurt a little bit, so... There are Christian parents today and their children have never heard them pray. Never heard their parents pray to the Lord. Sometimes going to church for decades, but never heard their, their, their parents praise God or give thanks or rejoice in his blessings, or humble themselves before him. How in the world can we pray together as a family when, when we can't get past our own insecurities enough to pray in front of those that we love? I will tell you, and I've told you this so many times before, establishing a good prayer life takes work. It takes effort, and your first couple of prayers will probably be clumsy. Praise God. You don't think that clumsy prayer pleases him? The first time you voice prayer to him in front of someone you love, you don't think that pleases the Lord? It's your heart that he's after. And as that relationship becomes more natural, your prayer life will grow, and your children will see that. Went to a men's breakfast uh, at Parkway yesterday morning. I got to see my nephew, who's uh, he's probably 20, grab two of my sons and pray with them. How bold is that for a young man? We have adults that won't do that. And the reality is, i got to tell you, and the difficulty is, is because we're proud. And we don't want to be lousy at things. We don't want to struggle at things. We don't want to, sometimes we don't even want to admit there's something wrong. Because if you're going to pray to the Lord about any dysfunction in your family, but you're going to have to be real about it because God already knows. And sometimes being real about it is difficult because when we're real about it, we own some of the dysfunction. Some of that dysfunction is ours. And what God will tell you when you're going to come to him in prayer, you're going to bring your family, the first thing you need to do is get the log out of your eye. You're going to gather your family in prayer. I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, start with confession. Clear your heart and then ask God's blessings on your family. That's difficult. That's humbling. Doesn't God call us to be humble? Amen. Healthy family isn't proud. Can't be proud and be a healthy family. Be grateful. Matthew 7, 12. I'm not even sure I got these notes to Tristan or not. It was a crazy week. 
That was the last one. Okay, you can write these in. Matthew 7, verse 12. Healthy families are built on thoughtful behavior toward one another. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it is opened. Which one of you, if his son, listen to me, Christ didn't choose that relationship accidentally. He wants them to get it. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, give him a stone? What bread? Bread of life. Are you going to give him something of the world instead? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If he asks for something that will save him, will you give him something that will kill him? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to you, those who ask him? He says it right there. If you can't give good things to your children, good and holy things, how can you come to God asking for good and holy things? And if you can do that, how much more will your Father in heaven bless you with good and holy things? And then he just kind of really, I'm just telling you, if, if you're a family walking through this, he's about, to, he's about to tip your boat over because verse 12 is the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. Good old golden rule. We hear it. We read it. And back in the day, it used to be hanging up on the wall at school, right? Back when it was okay that there was a God and he wanted you to be nice to each other, when that was still acceptable. But we got to really get past that. The question in that, whatever you wish others to do, read that quickly and then highlight, do also to them, for this is the law. Wives, and if you feel like your husband's not attentive enough to you, do you then become more attentive toward him? Because that's the golden rule, right? That's what you desire from him, and the golden rule says and you need to go do that. Husbands, I mean, do you feel like your wife is not loving enough? What's your response to that? Do you then in turn love her more? That's what this says, right? It's not me making you uncomfortable. Jesus. Kids, now you feel like your parents yell all the time? Like they're always mad at you? And do you try to yell less? Do you try to be kinder and less confrontational if that's what you desire from your parents? Or do you just keep squawking about everybody else in your family going, why can't you all get this right? I'll just tell you, Sometimes it feels like the, the ship's going down. And on the way down, we all have our hands around each other's throat. <laughs> funny, not funny. But in this passage, man, so what well, do to others what you'd have them do to you? We've got brothers and sisters, we've got to get past the fact that this is how we deal with that annoying person at work or that annoying in law. Right? It can't be just about things like that. We've got to back it into our own home. Do we apply the golden rule in our own home? Because sometimes I think we don't. I think we have this misconception of what these relationships look like based on what we see on TV and in the movies. And then we try to live within that worldly model of those relationships. Do we do anything to resolve these problems that we see in others? Or do we just point at them? Tell them about what they're doing wrong. Are we called to respond in a way that honors the golden rule? Everyone, listen to me. Everybody, Millie, listen. Everyone has a biblical role in the family. Everyone has a biblical role. Fathers, lead your family in the ways of the Lord. Mothers, support what the father's doing. Support 
that role of spiritual leadership. Kids, job to obey. Right? That's it. Obey your parents. Why? So it'll go well for you. Our kids know that verse. It's not punishment. It's not subjectiveness. Right. Thank you, Ian. He wants all of us to do these things so that we might grow in the Lord and be the model that he's called us to be. And we all have a role in it. And if any of those fail, the whole thing's going to fail. And it starts with the men. We had an interesting conversation once. Uh, Julia said some friends of hers that uh, the husband had quit going to church. That, that model where the husband stays home and mom and the kids get up and go to church. And Julia's friend was like, I don't know what to do because I feel like I'm the spiritual leader of the family. I'm not supposed to be. My husband's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the family. And what we kind of came to when we thought about it some was the husband still was. He was just leading them the wrong way. He was still the spiritual leader. He was taking his family the wrong way. Healthy families, verse 13 and 14. This is important. If you're, if you look, <laughs> you're looking for a way out right now, here it is. Healthy families are the result of deliberate choices. Enter by the narrow gate. Not passive. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. As an individual, this is not an easy walk, and as a family, it is certainly not an easy walk. What we're understanding, listen, there are easier ways to live than God's way. It says that. The easy way is going to be packed because people want the easy way. But what God has called us to, this narrow path is going to be a choice. It's going to be a decision that we make as a family that we do this, that our families might look different, that we might hold different values. We might not watch the same things on TV. Our kids may act and behave differently, that we might pause a conversation to make them say, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. That no matter what, we never speak poorly of our spouse. I don't care what the rest of the conversation is going on with people around us. That we hold and preserve that thing, that we work harder at spending quality time together. That we are in church together. Not because we're perfect or better than anybody else, but because we know this is where we're supposed to be as a family. I love our church because our family's set together. That's powerful if someone walks into here. Oh, wow, these people church together. Huh. It seems the rest of the world doesn't even understand that certain things might be out of bounds or unacceptable. But we've got to draw in to what is acceptable and what Scripture tells us. Again, not just as families. I'm sorry, not just as individuals, but as families, we have to stay on that narrow and difficult path. And this is going to take all of us. It's going to take everybody in your family. I don't care how old your kids are, how old your parents are. It's going to take everybody. The, uh, so this, uh, this may have seemed somewhat rambly today. We consider these passages, but my heart is heavy with the state of the American family. And when I see the problems our nation has, I firmly believe the solution is in our homes. That we fix the American family if we want anything else in America to follow. Because we're not going to fix it from the top down. We're going to fix it from the bottom up. We as Christians, we hold, we, we hold the key. We've got to look and be different. We can't, and we, we can't trust that the schools are going to teach our kids right and wrong. We just can't depend on that. 
You can't depend that all the scriptural education your children are going to get is going to be here. This is just one, one day a week. We can't continue to allow other people to do everything that God has called us to do. We've got to return to the formula that is the biblical model for Christian families. You want a healthy family? Within your family, you're going to have to become more interested in giving than getting. You have to be honest with each other in a loving and Christian way. You're going to have to pray together out loud. You're going to have to make a deliberate choice to walk the difficult way as a family. Anything short of that is going to land you right back where you are in the midst of trouble and discontent. So as the praise team comes up, and we consider the invitation today, uh, obviously we add to that some things that we might consider that this altar provides for us. We haven't talked about this in a while, but this idea of kneeling before the Lord, this submissive act that says to God, man, I have no defense now. I'm on my knees. Whatever you have for me, I submit to. Not in a position to argue, not in a position to resist. Here at the altar, submitting to you. If the altar stuff gives you the heebie-jeebies, you guys can you don't need to. Okay. Oh, I just want you to sit today. I don't want you to stand. You're welcome. And uh, I did that just for you. And gather your family. Just pray a little bit. Pray God's hand on what you do. If you don't have any family members here, grab, grab someone you love who's sitting next to you and pray for your family. Submit your family to the Lord during this time of invitation. And if you're outside of Christ you, and you don't understand why this isn't working better for you, Maybe it's your personal submission to the Lord, the acceptance of salvation that Jesus brought. Maybe that's the missing piece in your family. So the invitation is obviously open to anyone who is without Christ. As I always say, we as a church are moving in a direction. So happy to see each of you here today. If you want to be part of what we're doing as a church and you're a baptized believer, then the invitation is also for you. I will just pray with anybody, pray, uh, because I, I love doing that, love that God has called us to pray together. I, I submit myself as your pastor to you. If I can serve you by praying for you, then please allow me to serve you. Heavenly Father God, we just see these words, Lord, and we're, we're convicted at the same time. That while we might see our failings, Lord, we also see hope in what you've called us to do. And that we might step into that hope and step out of our, our personal ambitions and desires. That we might step into a hope of, of loving those you've given us to love in a better way. And that others may see that, Lord. And that through that, God, that through these things, Lord, that primarily you are glorified. That when people say, man, why, why does it seem like things are so good? You can see, you know, because God has done something for us. Because God has seen us, given us the tools to be a great family. We just submit these things to you. In Jesus' name.
beautiful name it is. Probably called Mercedes, but a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Didn't want to burn without us, but Jesus. Amen, amen. Uh, please be seated. Uh, one thing before Rick comes up and we do the, the Millie handoff and he covers the announcements, I'll say he's going to mention the business meeting that comes up next Sunday night and he won't say this, so I will. But part of that business meeting is we're going to vote on Rick as a deacon. So uh, a, a big thing for he and his family and a big thing for our church, proud mama right here. So and come and be, in part, come and be a part of that. That's going to chart our path as a church for the future as we dedicate these men to leadership. So please uh, be in attendance for that. is our coffee, all of the coffee drinkers, uh, myself included, because I drink coffee, so we'll just bring in some Keurig, uh, just kind of replenish the stock, you know what I mean? 
All right, uh, February 5th, the, we're going to do the communion next Sunday, and then, uh, like Scott said, we're going to do the business meeting at five or 6 o'clock. Uh, eight, February 18th is uh, blue, blue Grass and Barbecue. Uh, still working out the details on that. And then uh, February 24th and 25th, we're doing the uh, D-Now. Still kind of working out the on that. So we've got a little bit of time. We've got about a month. So it's not uh, an instant, but uh, Julia. March 3rd and 4th, if ladies. Uh, see me if you want information on that or to sign up for that. Um, if financially that's a um, issue, please see me about that. We will take care of that. Um, also going to jump in on some kids stuff on Wednesday nights. Uh, we are still doing a Tuesday night, the second, generally it falls on the second Tuesday, I'm sorry, Wednesday, not Tuesday, second Wednesday of the month. Um, and we are calling it the Meal and Missions Night, and we are trying to give the kids a mission-minded focus at least one Wednesday a month. Uh, if you would like to bless our kids and youth with a meal that night, please see me. There is a sign up. The date might be a little off, so see me personally about that. Um, and if you've got kids uh, and getting them involved in that Wednesday night program, it is it is, a, it is a beautiful thing to see kids thinking outside of themselves and um, thinking about others and sharing the gospel. So I think that's all. All right, let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this day, for allowing us to come to you and just hear your word. Thank you for allowing us to come together and just worship you. And even in the tough times, it's all about you. We glorify your honor. Glorify you in your precious and holy name. Amen.